that I wrote it. Okay, we're back, and uh, I'm going to introduce Vince Cerf, and I asked him uh, if there's anything particular you wanted to, uh, to say, and he said, make a brief. So, Vince Cerf, follow me in that video. suggest to you those are not the same uh, are very important. The fact that you can speak doesn't necessarily mean that anybody can hear you. And so it's necessary that we have both of those freedoms properly accounted for. Of course, I want an internet that's affordable. And, and this turns out to be very important because as the uh, capability extends further into the world, we're only about 28% penetrated now, 
uh, it is reaching places with very different economic conditions than the places where the internet started, uh, where economic conditions were uh, conducive uh, to its implementation. So uh, as we reach further and further in the world, it's more and more important to get the cost down. One of the reasons that mobile has been so effective at penetrating in the world is that the costs actually have been substantially less than wireline costs would have been in order to provide connectivity. And of course, the equipment itself uh, is getting less and less expensive over time. The internet also, the one I want, it has to be accessible. And uh, what I mean by this in part is that language should not be uh, a barrier. Internationalized domain names are an example of the kind of accessibility that uh, I hope we will see more of. But those who have various disabilities, like I have, I'm hearing impaired, uh, would like an internet that is accommodating in that regard, whether the disability is for vision or hearing or mobility or other uh, difficulty. We'd like an internet that accommodates uh, this kind of accessibility. I'd like it to be a broadband internet. Now, broadband is, is something which uh, is defined in various and sundry ways, but usually it means faster than whatever you can get now. <laughs> and and uh, really, that does seem to be the case because there was a time when broadband was thought of as 200,000 bits per second. Now, I honestly remember when the first 1200 baud modem came out, I thought, my god, it won't need anything faster than that. I can't read faster than that. And of course, uh, it didn't take long to realize that uh, it wasn't just human beings reading text uh, that was important on the net. It was you know, imagery and video and eventually machines talking to machines. Uh, so uh, broadband is important, both wired and wireless. Uh, our appetites for uh, uh, the use of bandwidth uh, simply increase over time. I want an internet that preserves privacy. I want an internet that's capable of providing confidentiality. Uh, I want an internet that allows anonymity, but I won't argue necessarily that it has to be absolute. And we'll come back to that uh, when we talk about safety on the internet. Uh, but there are plenty of uh, instances in which anonymity is, should be possible. Uh, you should be able to get to and are often offered access to the internet in public facilities like libraries uh, where you don't necessarily have to identify yourself. And it was already been mentioned several times in the early uh, proceedings today that there are cases where anonymity is in fact vital to life that uh, loss of anonymity could be equated to uh, potential loss of life or at least uh, imprisonment or other kinds of uh, pretty serious uh, consequences. And yet there are times when those anonymous voices need to be heard. Now, I will also admit to you that uh, speaking anonymously sometimes invites a lot of harmful speech as well. And so somehow or another we have to find an appropriate balance to deal with the extremes of, uh, of anonymity. Uh, I would think also that uh, I want an, an internet which uh, is transparent uh, and gives me some control over that which I want to keep private. Uh, I don't want to feel that I, in order to keep things private I have to completely uh, avoid using the internet. That would be a disappointing outcome. And so understanding what is available, what methods are available to me to keep things private, what things are being tracked, for example, can I tell uh, what is known about my use of the network, do I have any control over that, or uh, questions that I hope that I would have the ability to answer. But I want to focus uh, on the remaining time here uh, about an internet that's safe. And I think that here we have uh, a real challenge. Freedom from harm is not an easy thing to uh, implement, and yet I think most people who use the internet would like to think that it's safe to do so. Uh, so how can we achieve that? Well, there might be some uh, specific technical methods that would be helpful. For example, uh, using strong authenticity, using cryptographic methods for authentication can be a very powerful tool. But I want to emphasize very strongly that there is a difference between identifiers and identity. I want to distinguish between those two concepts. An identifier is simply uh, a string of, of characters it doesn't that, that do not necessarily mean anything. Identity is what you and I are. It's our names, it's our birthdays, it's our you know, domiciles, it's you know, where we work and so on. It's, a, it's a, a complex of information about us as individuals. 
I think it'd be very powerful if we could assume that in the internet you could strongly authenticate an identifier and, and, and simply say, hi, my name is Vint. You don't know who Vint is. You have no idea who Vint is, but here is my identifier, and I can strongly authenticate that. And the party on the other end should be able to say, okay, please execute your strong authenticity. And I would say, well, here's my public key. And they'll say, well, if that's your public key, then I should be able to encrypt a message to you in the public key, and you should be able to decrypt it. So that party sends me a random number encrypted in my public key. I decrypt it, and that party might say, please send me the response uh, of that random number in my public, encrypted in my public key. So you could do an exchange which simply assures both parties that you both have operating public and private key pairs. That's all you've, you've done. But what that allows you to do is the next time this individual approaches you or the next time you approach them and say, hi, I'm Vint, they'll say, well, if you're Vint, then you still have a functioning public and private key pair. Please decrypt this new random challenge. I can establish that I'm the same Vint that communicated before. Now, this is assuming I haven't had my private key compromised. Why am I going into all this detail? It's to persuade you that you can build on top of this notion of strong identifier, strongly authenticated identifier, to build up to, but not necessarily require, the notion of strong identity. I could then associate an identity with that identifier if I choose to do so. So I want an internet that allows for anonymity, that allows for strong authenticity of identifiers, and if on demand, allows for strong identity. So let me give you an example. Uh, suppose that uh, I come to you after having, we've had these exchanges, you know me as Vint, you know I can repeatedly authenticate myself as Vint, and I say I'd like to borrow $50,000. The natural response might be either buzz off or I need to know a little more about you. I need to know you as a person. I need to know something about your finances. Do you have a job? Do you have any collateral? And I might respond, and all of this could be encrypted so it would be confidential. I might respond and, and say, I work here, this is my income, and so on. Of course, this party, whom I've just asked for $50,000 from, doesn't necessarily know whether I'm telling the truth. So that party needs to be able to take the information that I provided and go to some other trusted third party to validate the information that I have offered. I could have voluntarily gone to such a trusted third party and provided that information and asked them to validate my information if they are requested to do so. And I realize there's a kind of infinite regression here. Do I trust the trusted third party and so on? I submit to you that we have faced this problem before in other domains and we've succeeded in finding people who will, are trusted to vouch for uh, your bona fides. Sometimes there's more than one. There are the credit card, the credit companies and so on. So the idea here is we should be able to build up a, a system of authentication and trust uh, and identity, but only invoked as it's needed. I certainly don't think it's necessary to have a driver's license, so to speak, an internet driver's license, and to identify yourself every time you use the internet. I think that would be remarkably inhibiting. Well, we're on the subject here of uh, safety and strong authenticity. I'm a big believer in two-factor authentication. I'm not a big believer in reusable passwords. These have been too easily compromised. We see the results of that every day. And so having the ability to use cryptographic means to strongly authenticate yourself with two factors is something that's so important to me that we use it at Google all the time internally, and we make this capability available uh, to uh, our users as well. Um, I want to now speak a little bit more on the safety side, but with regard to uh, protections, technical uh, initiatives that we can take to protect people. Uh, one thing uh, which we might want to be protected from is spam. And for the moment, most of our protections are in the form of filtering. So Google, Gmail, and others try to figure out what's spam and what isn't and try to filter it out if you ask uh, that it be done. Uh, I do wonder whether we will ever get to the point where we can have authenticated email. And you, if, if we could uh, achieve the objective of having strong authentication for an email source, then you might decide to say, I don't want to see anything except strongly authenticated email. 
and anything else I'll consider spam or I'll consider it second class material. So filter everything that you believe is spam, put everything that is strongly authenticated over here and the stuff in the middle I will look at it on occasion. But we should be working towards tools that will allow us to ask for those kinds of services. We worry about viruses and worms and Trojan horses and things like that. These are all examples of some of the harms, some of the bad behaviors that we see in the internet. It wasn't in the original internet because it was a very homogeneous collection of engineers. They did, had no motivation for doing any of the things we see today. Once the general public is part of the internet environment, all of the good things and all the bad things about the general public, about us, show up on the network and we have to do something about that. We can't ignore it. So being able to detect that viruses are present or worms are present or Trojan horses are present or, or detecting that an intrusion has taken place, that someone is using the network in a way that wasn't intended, uh, are all important tools for protecting us, whether we're in an enterprise context or a residential setting. Moreover, some of the uh, tools that we use uh, to use the network that have operating systems in them or have browsers running are also sources of weakness and vulnerability. And we have a responsibility if we're going to build a safe network to improve those operating systems, to improve the browsers. Most of the infections that, that occur, uh, machines that become um, infected, uh, are infected through browsers that are uh, ingest the software that, that it really shouldn't ingest and causes changes to the operating systems and creates uh, zombie machines which become part of botnets which then get used to generate spam or produce denial of service attacks. So we need to work on better uh, quality and more, maybe more paranoid uh, operating systems and browsers. There's a recent development which I find quite a attractive in this domain. Uh, when your machine first boots up, it runs something called BIOS, which is sort of a basic uh, I.O. system that boots in the operating system. That's a very vulnerable moment for any piece of computing equipment because it's basically pulling in the operational software. Uh, the National Security Agency, uh, in partnership with industry, has now proposed and uh, the industry is responding uh, to have cryptographically uh, validated BIOS software, which is firmware. And so before that program, which boots in the operating system, actually runs, the hardware checks to see whether it is digitally signed properly. And it won't run that boot program unless the digital checksum uh, works out. Moreover, if you're going to update that BIOS program, it checks first to see whether the update is digitally signed properly. And if it isn't, it won't do the update. These are, are really combinations of hardware and software in order to improve the, um, reduce, let's say, the vulnerability of a machine uh, to, uh, to becoming infected. And so having um, instituted this, uh, uh, what I will call sharing of hardware and software protections, I think is a very powerful and extremely general purpose idea. This is operating at a very low level uh, in the infrastructure of devices that use the internet. There are uh, ways of detecting sites, uh, websites that have become infected. When Google does uh, the index of the World Wide Web, it sends crawlers out to download every single home page that it can find. And as the software is downloading those uh, pages, it's looking to see whether there are any possible viruses or worms or Trojan horses. Now, it's a piece of software that's doing this, so it's not perfect. But if it detects uh, what it believes is an infected uh, website, it will mark that website as having potentially malicious software. If you use the Google search uh, tool and it happens to pull up one of the websites that has this infection indication, if, if you try to go there by clicking on the link, a big red uh, interstitial page comes up saying, you may not want to go there. We think that there's software that would infect your machine. Uh, we're not always correct. And some website holders are quite unhappy when they realize that they're being, uh, that their access to their websites are being intervened by this uh, bright red warning page. Uh, and they often will complain. We send them to an organization called Stop Badware, which uh, has spun out of the uh, Harvard uh, Berkman Center. They do the job of analyzing the websites and helping the uh, website holder or res responsible party to debug and, and remove any uh, 
uh, infecting software. Sometimes they'll say, I didn't put anything in there. Why are you uh, pointing the finger at me? And the answer is, you didn't put anything there, but somebody else did because the security of your website wasn't sufficient to prevent someone from infecting that website. So this is another example of a protective move to make the network safer. There are other things that are happening in the technical space. The domain name system security extensions, which digitally sign entries in the domain name system, have been instituted for some time now. The, uh, uh, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers is now signing the root zone of the domain name system, and that propagates downward into uh, the uh, secondary and tertiary and so on zones of the, uh, of the domain name system. That's actually a very important tool. You can ask for a digitally signed response when you do a lookup in the domain name system and that gives you increasing um, confidence that the internet address that's pointed to is in fact the same as the one that was put in there by the party who was responsible for that domain name. This, uh, it may be extended in many other ways to uh, allow uh, installation of certificates in the domain name system as well, as opposed to relying solely on certificate authorities to identify uh, a party uh, using cryptographic means. There's more detail there, but I don't have time to go into that. I want to shift now, remember, we're in this, in this space of talking about a safe internet. What else could we do to make it safer? Well, there are legal protections that might also be needed in order to make the network safe. If you can't inhibit, through technical means, bad behavior and abuse of the net, you don't have a whole lot of other options. The other options tend to fall into the category of saying, we have agreed that these things are socially unacceptable, these behaviors are unacceptable, and if we catch you, if we catch you, there will be consequences. This is how we deal with a lot of abusive behavior. People drink and drive, and we say, don't do that, and they do it anyway, and they run into each other, or they harm themselves, or they harm property. And we say, well, if we catch you, there will be consequences. One could make the same argument for abusive behavior on the internet. Part of the problem is that the internet is global in scope. And the harms that might be visited upon a victim could come from anywhere on the internet, which means it could come from anywhere in the world, which means it could come across a national boundary. The implication of that is that if we are going to do anything about what we might collectively agree is unacceptable behavior on the net, then we're going to have to have some kind of international reciprocity. We're going to have to have treaty uh, agreements about which behaviors we collectively believe are unacceptable and what we're willing to do about them. But in order to make this effective, it has to be a cooperative effort in the same way that the internet doesn't work without the cooperation of all the various internet service providers that are interconnected with each other. Now, to, on a more positive note with regard to uh, legal uh, protections, imagine that we decide that um, the digital signatures are an important element to have in place for e-commerce so that people can uh, essentially conclude contracts online. Now the question will be if we use all the tools for digital signatures and two parties agree on a contract and they each digitally sign this, uh, this contract, the question then will be when one of the parties breaks the contract, breaches uh, the agreement, how does the other party respond and what recourse does that party have? Well, if a digital signature does not have the same strength, legal strength, as a wet one does, when you try to uh, remediate this breach, you may discover there's no legal support for it. So here again, we would need reciprocity. We would need to have agreements, for example, about what it means to issue a digital certificate, what uh, actions have you taken to validate the party's identities before you issue the certificate so that the party can use uh, a public and private key for digital signatures? Uh, what are the legal frameworks in which you can bring a complaint and under what conditions uh, will that complaint be heard and be given credibility uh, on, the on the basis of a signed uh, digital contract? So here would be uh, something that we could do that's constructive because the intent is to improve our ability to perform uh, electronic commerce. One thing that I worry a lot about any kind of discussion of legal uh, protections in the internet is that there be due process associated with any actions that are taken. Um, one should anticipate, expect equal treatment under the law. 
And once again, this is a complex matter because it's international uh, in its character. But the idea that, that actions cannot be taken or will not be taken without due process, without proper notice, um, and without proper authority seems to me a very important element in any expectation of a safe uh, network. Uh, we're all familiar, I think, with the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and we've heard from time to time about access to the internet being characterized as a human right. I have to admit to you that I find that an odd formulation in a way to pick a particular technology and bind uh, a human right to it. If the internet changes, which it almost assuredly will, uh, one would wonder whether you have to rewrite the human rights. And here I think internet is simply a manifestation of a set of more fundamental human rights about the ability to speak and be heard, uh, the ability to be kept safe from harm. And so I, my ten tendency would be not to point at the internet and claim access to it as a human right, but rather say the human rights of, uh, of expression and freedom to hear and the like are manifest in the internet uh, and whatever it turns into. Uh, I do want to mention that there are a couple of other possible constructive things that we could do to make the internet safer. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, uh, have, know about the fire department and you know that if there's a building on fire that you have the ability to call the fire department and say there's a building on fire. The fire department uh, has authority to do some fairly extreme things. If the building's on fire, it can break in the doors and the windows and into the roof, it can pour water into the building, it can do quite a bit of damage in the process of putting out the fire, and yet we accept that because the danger of that building on fire is that other buildings nearby might also catch fire and people's property and lives might be uh, at risk. We don't have a cyber fire department, but it occurs to me that something like that might be an interesting concept to pursue. Many of us are not in, in a position to put the fire out in the house. I mean, you, can you imagine standing in front of the house with your garden hose, realizing that you really want somebody there with a much bigger hose and a lot more water? Well, in the cyber fire, if you're under attack, your company is under attack, and you don't have the skills or the personnel or the equipment to respond, you might want somebody else to do that. Now, the question is, if we create such a notion of a cyber fire department, what um, authorities will it have? What is it permitted to do in the course of trying to defend against a cyber attack? And one question, of course, is can a competitor call the cyber fire department and have it attack his, uh, his competing uh, customer? I'm sorry, com his competitor. Um, you know, and, and <laughs> so we have to have some kind of rules that say when you can invoke the cyber fire department, but having access to better expertise to protect yourself seems like it would be an interesting idea. This also leads to the notion of forensics and improving uh, of tools for forensics. If we're going to have an internet that is safer, then those who would abuse it and abuse its users uh, need to be discoverable. And in order for that to happen, we need better forensic tools than we have today. Uh, once again, I'd be very concerned about the, the question of privacy, confidentiality, and other rights that, uh, and due process and so on. But we still need to accept that there are people, people who cause harm on the net who have to be found and that we should be mindful of creating tools and methods and a legal framework in which that can be done. So let me, uh, let me stop there and uh, simply say one more time that uh, uh, we say that the internet is for everyone, but it isn't yet. Uh, we say that uh, it should be for everyone. I say it must be for everyone. And I hope it will be for everyone. Thank you very much. So we're going to do Q&A, but given the fact that I'm hearing impaired, you're going to have to put up with a Geraldo-style Q&A session. I have this uh, microphone, which I will turn on, and if you raise your hand, I will come rushing down the aisle uh, in the hope that I'll be able to read your lips if I need to. Uh, so uh, here we go, and the first question is right there. This is working? Yes. 
Hi, this is uh, Sara Freixa from Melbourne IT. And uh, I was wondering, we were talking, or you were talking about privacy, calling for protection, and uh, safer internet. Uh, are you concerned at all that this might change with the new GTLDs? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, first of all, uh, let me distinguish between uh, the internationalized domain names and the Latin domain names. There, I hope that the new GTLDs accommodate both because I think people whose languages are not naturally expressible in Latin characters would appreciate the ability to express domain names in something other than Latin characters. I don't think that the new GTLDs are necessarily any more uh, risky than the collection of domain names that we have today. If you look, there are 147 million domain names, apparently, and that's just at the second level, I think. Uh, so the um, believability or the, you know, the, how do you know what that domain name means is no more and no less risky in the new GTLD world than it is in the existing domain name world. It's just that some of these are now at the top level domain, uh, at top level as opposed to second level. So once again, we're back to um, something that I bet every one of us should be mindful of, and that is that we should be thinking more critically about our use of the internet than we sometimes do. If we believe that everything on the internet we hear and see is true, that's a mistake. Uh, if we're raising children, probably the best tool that we can teach them is critical thinking. They should be thinking about all the information they get. The internet is just sort of a stark example of the full range of content and misinformation and mistakes and so on and maybe even deliberate uh, uh, errors. We should, but we want our kids not only to be thoughtful about what they see on the internet, but we want them to be thoughtful about what they read in the newspapers, if they still read newspapers, uh, or watch on television, or hear on the radio, or what they get from their friends or from their parents uh, and their teachers. They should be thinking critical, <laughs> critically about all of that, including internet. So I think it's not any worse than it is now, but we can do ourselves do better by thinking. Okay, let me get this gentleman over here and then I'll come back. Uh, thank you, uh, the name is Eric. <clears throat> and um, I would like to point out to the book, The Filter Bubble, and it recently came out and they pointed out some of Google's new tactics or uh, strategies with regards to when someone does a search that the, that the results are tailored to that person and the data that's been gathered on that person. How much further can this go? Can it get into video when someone's using uh, the video chat feature, for example, and there's image recognition of brands that they're wearing, or there's analysis of their facial expressions? And you know, what do you foresee as to how far this kind of recording can be done? That's a good question. So, uh, Google's actually been very cautious about any kind of. Uh facial recognition and other kinds of practices, although I gather that uh, Facebook has just announced something that, along those lines. The technology is there uh, to do a lot of the things that you've described. And so uh, as a society, I, I think we have a responsibility to try to say something about what those limits should be. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking the, from your question that you're engaged in that. Good for you, keep doing, keep working it. Um, there are obvious situations where these techniques could be very useful. We're back into the, the question of harm, on, on not just on the internet, but harm in, our, in the world we live in. But the question about when those tools get applied and under what conditions and with whom that information is shared is a very big question for me. It's not very different in some ways to, to the question about who should have access to medical information, just to, to pick another analogy. Um, there are times when, uh, let me give you a, a scenario. Let's suppose you're in a strange city you've never been in, in before and you have a medical emergency. At the moment that this emergency occurs and you're in the emergency room, probably, the, assuming you're still conscious, the last thought in your mind is keeping from the people who are trying to help you through this crisis, 
hiding medical information from them. You basically want them to know as much as possible so they can do the right thing for you to get through this medical emergency. On the other hand, you probably would not want it to be the case that the parties who had access to all of that information during the emergency will now have access to your medical files forever after that. What you would want is to have some sort of a finite time limit after which that access is no longer available. Credit cards have a similar uh, element to them. They expire. So the idea of expiring privileges for access to certain kinds of information strikes me as being a pretty powerful notion that we might want to apply also to the things that you were talking about, about facial recognition or other kinds of recognition things. I have to admit to you that um, privacy is becoming pretty hard to come by. And I have one uh, other personal anecdote uh, that surprised me. Maybe it shouldn't have, but it did. Uh, there was a meeting in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And the security team said to me, I'm sorry, please don't take the car to get from the airport to Sao Paulo because there's only one road and if there's a problem, you can't get off the road. And I said, well, what's your suggestion? They said, take a helicopter. I said, well, that's okay with me. It only takes 12 minutes by helicopter instead of two hours in the car. So we took the helicopter from the airport. We landed in front of the hotel. And about 20 minutes later, somebody came up, tapped me on the shoulder, and said, uh, you're on YouTube. I said, what do you mean I'm on YouTube? He said, well, somebody um, saw you landing in the helicopter and took a video of it and then put it up on YouTube. It was actually fairly amusing because the person who did this had no idea I was on the helicopter. He just thought it was cool the helicopter was landing. So he videoed the whole thing down. The helicopter lands. I get out, and you hear him say, that's Vince Cerf. <laughs> then he put it up on YouTube. <laughs> so, I, and it was you know, only 20 minutes or something. So what that tells me, uh, told me anyway, is that here we are walking around with our uh, cameras and our video recorders and our audio recorders and our radios and our texting capability and everything else. Uh, the ability to remain anonymous is almost uh, evaporated at this point. Okay, thank you. I had, there was, some, yes, right here. June Klein and I do some uh, collaborative research with the Oxford Internet Institute specifically on the fifth estate. Um, I have two questions about that. Oh, sure. Just you're covering your mouth. Oh. I can't do you like the Oh. Okay. Um, I'm June Klein and I, okay. Anyway, um, regard, I have two questions related to the fifth estate. Uh, first, I find it very curious that with all um, the type of people who are here and at other conferences like this in the United States, that nobody's mentioned the fifth estate. Um, whereas when you go abroad, everybody seems to understand what it is. And I find that very, very curious. Second thing is if you take clear-cut examples of the fifth estate, such as um, I paid a bribe.com in India, and uh, uh, which was just, you know, it was showcased, yes, it was just showcased on uh, BBC radio. And apparently they've been pretty successful at it as well. They have made some changes. And then you look at WikiLeaks and you look at Arab Spring, and the question is, what do you think the reaction will be in terms of internet public policy? Are you going to see more kill switches? Or are you going to see more of a backlash that I want a bigger role of the internet? So that's a very interesting question. Remember, you've asked an engineer uh, a political question, so you deserve the answer that you get. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> First of all, a, any, any regime that believes that it can only survive by hiding information from the population uh, is going to be threatened by the technology that we've been talking about today. Uh, and so there will be certain places where there will be very strong negative reactions to freedom of speech and everything else. It's no surprise you understand that. I also at least hope I won't say I know, but I will say I hope that, uh, that we are able to retain an internet that does keep this freedom and openness and ability to create transparency from evaporating. 
Now, the kill switch, you know, let's refer specifically to the Egyptian case for a concrete example. The kill there was to kill the underlying transport. The internet packets are not magic. They have to be carried on something. The fact that they don't care what they're carried on is important because it allows us to use lots of different technology to implement the motion of internet packets from one place to another. But if there is nothing to carry them, they won't go anywhere. And so shutting down the underlying transport is one way of killing the internet. What I believe would happen, however, if that were to, to go on for any appreciable period of time, that people would bring in radios, they would do mesh networking, there would be a variety of, of uh, inventions or implementations to overcome that. These are not new technologies. This is entirely doable today. I have a mesh network running in my house. It's an IPv6 sensor network and uh, it keeps track of the temperature and humidity and so on. Every five minutes I get a little report that goes into a, uh, a server down in the rack in the basement. And twice a day I get a little note saying, what's the status of my, uh, my house? Unless the temperature goes up above 60 degrees in the wine cellar, in which case I get an SMS emergency. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a mesh technology. And I think a yeah, population whose ability to speak and hear is being suppressed will find ways to bring technology in in order to redress that weakness. So I hope that uh, the, the internet will, I, I like to say that IP runs over everything, including you if you're not paying attention to what's going on. Okay, let me get this gentleman, then we'll go here and then I'll go over there. Hi. Um, Yes, Jeremy Pesner, self-affiliated. Um, there's been a lot of to do about um, IPv4 versus IPv6. That's a very clear example of how the internet needs to evolve to survive today. I guess what I'm curious is, having seen the, literally the lifetime of the internet, what other sorts of shortcomings and issues and pitfalls need to be addressed in order to keep it uh, evolving and vibrant for how it's being used today and in the future? Uh, plainly, uh, the address space is one limitation, and that's what the V6 is all about. Uh, another one is this um, thing I talked about earlier, strong authentication, two-factor uh, authentication, and things like that. What we want, or what I want anyway, is the ability to ask for you to strongly identify yourself when I ask you to do that. You have the freedom to say, no, I won't, in which case I'll say this conversation is over. Um, but the, the idea that we have tools available for that purpose is absolutely essential. I think that for internet to continue to grow, uh, we're going to see another dimension expanding. In Europe, you hear the term Internet of Things. Here in the United States, you hear about the smart grid. I believe that there are going to be billions of devices on the network, and getting those devices fully interconnected with everything else on the net uh, is a very important uh, step in the direction of making the net more useful. At the same time, that poses risks, because if every appliance in your house is accessible on the internet, what happens if the 15-year-old next door reprograms your house while you're away? <laughs> so once again, we're back to strong authentication being a very important element in making this expanding internet a safe place in which to build new applications. Apart from that, um, there are uh, we, we have not made very good use of broadcast media in the internet. So if you're looking for another technical avenue for expansion, I can hardly wait to start getting services in satellites that literally broadcast internet packets to hundreds of millions of receivers all at the same time. We've been doing that for years with television, but what I want is the ability to carry any form of digital information in packet form from a satellite down to hundreds of millions of receivers. It's a very efficient way of delivering a large amount of the same information. And I don't want to be limited anymore to simply delivering audio or video. I want the ability to deliver anything that I can digitize and packetize. That's a step which I hope is taken because it would uh, be another platform on top of which you could build some very interesting applications. There's more, but I'll stop there. Let's see, I'm trying to, I had this gentleman back here and then I'll get to Julie. And then I'll move there. Uh, my name is John Gilberg. I'm with Blue Fountain Media. Uh, you've spoken very eloquently about the future of the web. If you can put yourself back in your 1990 shoes, 
Is the web of 2011 anything like you could have imagined or any parts of it like you might have imagined? Oh, of course. I mean, everything's happening exactly the way we imagined it would. I mean, you know, what, what do you... <laughs> so, really, um, if you... Let's go all the way back. Let's go to 1973. Bob Kahn and I are is sitting here, he comes to Stanford and he says, I have a problem. I said, what's your problem? He says, well, I got three different kinds of packet switch nets and I have to hook them together somehow. And uh, that's what we worked on for about six months. And that's what the TCP IP protocols were all about. So uh, you might say, well, you know, did you do that in a vacuum? And the answer is no. Did you understand how powerful this kind of technology could be? The answer was yes. Did we know all the applications that people would invent? No. But 1973 is a really interesting year, so I want you to really appreciate the context. 1973, uh, in 1973, I was at Stanford University, Bob Kahn was at DARPA, and Xerox Park was around the corner from my lab at Stanford. In May of 1973, Bob Metcalf invents the Ethernet. In 1971 or 72, email gets invented on the ARPANET. In 1968, Doug Engelbart is talking about hyperlinks and you know the knowledge society and knowledge works and he builds a one node system which you could you could characterize as kind of a single computer world wide web i mean i don't mean to do any uh, uh, disservice to uh, my friend over tim over there but the idea of being groups of people sharing information in a common uh, environment is what doug was so excited about but he invented the mouse he invented the portrait mode display. He invented the linking of things from one file to another in that machine. It was called the online system. Now, all of this is available to Bob and to me as we're thinking about how do we build this internet piece. So, in some sense, we had a very uh, strong sense of the power of all this. Even social networking became visible as a consequence of the networked email. The first email distribution list was sci-fi lovers. It's engineers, what do you expect? A bunch of geeks. <laughs> and then the next one was Yum Yum, if I'm remembering right, which was a distribution list of restaurant reviews coming out of Stanford. So engineers are, you know, interested in science fiction and they like food. So it's not a surprise that you would see those two things. But you could see the power of the distribution list. So uh, honestly, I think we had a sense of, of a lot of power, but I don't think we knew what would happen when two billion people got online. And the particular thing which astonished me more than anything was when Tim's capability became widely available, the willingness of people to pour a huge amount of information into the net simply for the joy of knowing it might be useful to somebody else. There wasn't any obvious re remunerative mechanism. They just wanted to know that what they were doing might be useful to someone else. Or maybe someone else would be interested in the same thing they are and they would then get to know them and get to work together. So the, the, the astonishing thing about the web is this outpouring of content. And of course it continues today. Let's, we got, okay, well can I do one more? Thank, thank you, Julie Rones, and I'm a member of the DC chapter of the Internet Society and a lawyer, and I'm wondering your thought about authentication. Um, you cited the credit card companies as being an example of how that was achieved in a different context. Um, do you have any recommendations as to who would pay for this or how that would be achieved? Um, looking at the potential of the cost benefit, but would would the uh, businesses pay for that? Would end users, would it be a collaboration or have you given that some thought? Yes. So uh, strong authentication involves the ability to uh, generate, uh, to use cryptographic pairs and to both sign things and encrypt or decrypt them. And uh, the scenario that I wish I could persuade the banks to uh, undertake goes the following. Um, today we use credit cards with these little magnetic strips on them. They are not very secure. It's possible to actually fabricate a, a card by using a hot iron and some more you know, uh, metal oxide tape. So um, ideally, oh, what have I just done? You know, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's just geeks, right? And besides, if you Google it, you'll find it on the net anyway. 
Okay, so, so my proposition is that if the bank said, look, we really want you to have this smart card that has the ability to generate uh, cryptographic authent authenticity, uh, because it will allow us not only to protect uh, the use of the card, but also offer services that we would not be willing to offer on the basis of the magnetic strip card because of the stronger authentication. I th and if, they, if, if people, if they said, by the way, you can't get any money out of the ATMs if you don't have one of these cards, everybody would get one of the cards. They would get, because 90% of all the cash that is dispensed in the U.S. anyway is through an ATM machine now, not the, at the tellers. So um, if, if everybody had such a card and the teller machines had readers in order to implement the proposition, then that would form an infrastructure that would make it of interest to people building devices, whether it's personal computers or laptops or notebooks, to be able to sense those cards. Or maybe you would use near field uh, communication or might use a, a physical uh, contact on the card. But the point here is that, that once that infrastructure is in place, you begin to use it for a variety of other applications. So the problem is getting to the point where there's a, a rationale, a, a motivation for getting these smart card-like capabilities in place. And I submit to you that we are not very far away from there given the set of risks that we're all starting to see. So I'm hoping that uh, if the bank uh, scenario that doesn't hold up, maybe another one will. Uh, I know I'm not wearing it now, but I carry around a two-factor cryptographic uh, generator as part of my ID at Google. I can't use the internal uh, systems at Google without it. And uh, if we all begin to think in those terms, maybe we will create the incentive to do that. So I have to stop here. I'll turn this over to Sally again.